everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of the TFGI podcast brought to you by the Trade Finance Distribution Initiative. Today, we received two guests, Morgan Terigi, CEO and co-founder of IncomeLend, and Swajit Rath, CEO of IncomeLend Capital. IncomeLend is a global invoice financing marketplace, and IncomeLend Capital offers managed fund services to institutional and accredited investors. Both companies are under the IncomeLend group of companies with their headquarters in Singapore. So Morgan is a serial entrepreneur and has over 20 years of experience in trade and manufacturing, while Swajit comes from an investment background. IncomeLend is currently working on ambitious plans to make trade assets tradable. So that's one of the topics that we will discuss today. So welcome Morgan and Swajit, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So let's start with you, Morgan. Can you perhaps give us a quick introduction to Income Land and tell us about how you started the company? So Income Land is specialized in cross-border receivables financing. So anytime you have a, um, an exporter working an open account, say 30 days to 120 days, um, selling to an overseas customers, uh, we step in to provide financing whenever they need financing after shipment. This is what Income Lend is doing on a notified basis, uh, very transparent where the exporter and the importer are fully informed that we step in and we buy the receivable to provide a quick um, a support, financial support to the exporter that would not be able to wait, in other words, for 30 to 120 days. Um, I come from um, a manufacturing and trading background, as you mentioned, as an entrepreneur, um, you don't often have the luxury of having um, banks providing significant or sufficient support, uh, financial support for your, your business. And one of the, um, one of the, the, the things that was always um, for me that I couldn't understand uh, before and was something that I wanted to make an impact with, with Income Land is um, to have access to financing whenever we, um, an exporter has a good uh, buyer on the other side, it could be a well-known name in North America or, or Europe, uh, is to get access to financing without having to use one's balance sheet. So that was really the perspective that we took when, when setting up income land. So I mentioned cross-border receivables, but it's really cross-border receivables on non-recourse basis. In other words, for the exporter not to have to provide any, um, any uh, collaterals or deposit. So the idea of income land revolved around a need that I was finding as an entrepreneur and manufacturer when your business is growing, how to provide um, support to your business without um, putting too much pressure on your balance sheet. So that was the idea. And it was a time when a lot of um, platforms started uh, appearing in various countries and China, namely, and also Singapore, um, that we thought, okay, this is uh, something that is interesting because there is a growing awareness around the, the, the alternative finance space this is something that is growing and we wanted to drive it in a way um, that I knew was very useful based on my past experience. So this is how Incremland actually took birth. Uh, and that was uh, some six years ago. Okay, great. And Swajit, perhaps you can step in here as CEO of Incremland Capital. Can you explain to us how you became involved with the Trade Finance Distribution Initiative? Sure. So income land capital is that part of income land that faces with investors. Uh, our job is to obtain financing for the invoices that we originate and risk manage and operate. And as part of that, I've been looking to expand our uh, base of investors that was quite strong in high net worth and some smaller funds to include newer funds. That brought me across an existing relationship with um, income land that I took further which was the relationship with Trade Tech. So Trade Tech was a, is a platform through which we can take our invoices and turn them into notes. They're, for certain investors, there is a preference to invest through notes. And that's how, uh, through the relationship through Trade Tech, I became aware of the, the body TFDI. And I thought this would be, a, this is a body we would like to work with to uh, educate investors interested in our products. Um, of income lens, business model, and um, ability to deliver these assets. Okay, I see. So from your uh, experience working with investors, then where is the demand for trade assets coming from and what are the formats that investors typically prefer? Sure. So in this low interest rate environment, we're investing in cash and many fixed income instruments as punitive. 
And in this environment where stock markets are hitting record highs every single day, we see investor demand coming from a few channels. And though depending on the channel, that determines the format. We have ultra high net worth individuals, family offices that have made money on starting a business, sold out, uh, you know, starting a commodity linked business, capitalize that. We have uh, fixed income funds that are extremely worried uh, that they have pension liabilities or liabilities that they're unable to meet through investing in their products. And they're both looking for what I like to characterize it is a medium return, low risk asset. And that's where we're seeing the demand coming from regarding investors. So high net worth family office and professional fixed income investors. The format depends often on the kind of investor. The, we have many investors on our platform who are high net worth and family office. They often would prefer to choose the invoice or invoices they finance, or they may invest in us through one of our fund products, which is a collection of managed invoices. Many of the larger funds would prefer to invest in the note format because notes, bonds, and loans are an asset class they're already familiar with. So they're familiar with this asset class. We're just saying inside the note is an invoice, and that's something that they and their risk management and their management can get familiar with more quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Uh, when we spoke earlier to prepare for this uh, for this podcast, uh, you mentioned that Incomeland is making trade finance a traded asset class, which I thought was quite different from what I've heard so far. So can you explain a little bit uh, more about that, how you're planning to do that, how it would work, and what you're trying to achieve with that? Sure. And it's, it's really important, Melody, I, I clarify, it's in the early stages, and this is yet to be done. But there is a clear path you know, fraught with obstacles, but there's at least a clear path forward. So we have this asset class, which is massive and is centuries old. That's one. We have a very relevant asset class and one which in a low interest environment and a high credit risk environment seems particularly suitable. But we've never managed, it's typically been something that's been owned by banks. The first step is to take the asset class and put it into a format that investors can invest in without having to change much. So uh, the core group of people I think we are focused on are fixed income investors, bond investors, mutual funds, pension funds that buy bonds and they can buy notes. So that's the first step. The second step is the early stages of our partnership that's, you know, that's definitely moving on and it's, it's so far been very collaborative with Reuters Refinitiv. They are very interested, and they have done so, in bringing alternative assets to their marketplace. They have platforms with tens of thousands of users. So the way it would work is, if you own a bond and you are a Reuters terminal user, if you want a bond in, uh, if you uh, in, if you want a bond with Vodafone in the UK, the, we could perhaps show you well for Vodafone, where does the bond trade and where does the trade finance asset trade. You don't know trade finance, but you're struggling for yield and you have bonds and convertibles and preferred notes. This is another instrument. By educating fixed income investors on this and by pro income lend originating, risk managing and standardizing the project product, we hope that these investors will take the chance, purchase an asset and when unhappy or when happy that you know, they've held it for long enough, sell it to another entity. So we need an existing large marketplace, which is provided by Reuters Affinitiv. We need a note format, which is trade tech, and we need the origination of the asset and risk management, which is entirely done by income lend. I understand. So what would be the benefits of being able to trade these trade finance assets for the trade finance ecosystem in general? Okay, so there are a few that I've thought of. The first one, and this is super important, is liquidity. Trade finance, the invoices that we transact are typically 90 to 120 days. That's short maturity, but it's still not the kind that investors can get from bonds. If we provide this market and we create liquidity, many, many more investors would be willing to come in, especially investors new to trade finance. It's, it's not much time in my eyes to hold an asset for 90 to 120 days, but if you have an investor who wants to exit in a day, Providing them that kind of liquidity, which can happen in a marketplace, would be key. That's number one. Two, linked to number one, is pricing. 
there is a historically widespread between trade finance invoices on high quality companies and their bonds. 200, 300 basis points is not abnormal. We're seeing that. If we have liquidity and these assets are traded, I ex express, expect that spread to decline, which means companies can finance their exports at even cheaper prices. If we can fund it cheaper, we can turn around and offer those same attractive prices to our customers who are suppliers. And a third one is standardization. Once a few assets start trading, we can go back and say, look, this is the standard the market determines. We can tell suppliers, you, we can't do things case by case. If you want a low price, this is what you need to provide investors. And, and um, there may be more opportunities to speak on this later in the interview, but one of the things we're doing is we're very keen to see if there are ways we can incorporate environmental protections or environmental norms into our instruments. That's what the market demands. It's a very powerful tool to go to a customer and say, if you incorporate this into your, into your business model, we can get you cheaper pricing. Here's the market proof for it. So those are the three things, liquidity, pricing, standardization. Yeah, this all sounds amazing, and I will definitely ask you more about the ESG standards in a little bit. Um, but you mentioned that this is not uh, the path to, to uh, being able to trade trade assets, um, is not without its obstacles. So I wonder, considering where we are now, where you know trade asset distribution is being done, but not exactly uh, on a widespread kind of scale, um, what do you think it will take to reach a level where this is standard practice? I think creating a market from scratch is going to take, but if we look at historical precedents for the mortgage market, CDS, or look at token markets now, does take some time. I think we're very fortunate that on initial discussions with Reuters Refinitiv, they're patient, and we're going to start, the plan is for income to start with a few assets, two to three. Let's build a market there. The goal eventually would have dozens of assets trading tens of millions of each, but they believe that there are enough people interested, including our existing investors, uh, that we can start with a few names, turn over only in the millions, and then grow from there. I find dollars move extremely fast if you can provide a credible investment opportunity on an existing platform. So we're telling investors, you're already on Reuters LSC. You're already a fixed income investors. You're comfortable with the structure. Why not put a little money to work? And the numbers in fixed income are in the trillions. We only need a few hundred million, which is you know, less than a fraction of a percent in these to start to grow the market. So I think we need that first few deals. They need to work out. And then the market is will just grow exponentially. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. We'll be looking forward to hearing uh, news about that then coming from you. Uh, Morgan, if I can turn back to you, can you perhaps uh, tell us a little bit more about this ESG program that Income Lend um, has announced to connect institutional investors keen to support ESG centric businesses with socially responsible and sustainable SMEs? What do you hope to achieve with that? Well, I think there's a um... There's definitely, especially in the uh, in the European side, a growing awareness around the importance of ESG standards, and and this is um, uh, where investors want to invest more and more of their money to 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 impact the whether it be the environment in one shape or form through environmental issues or the uh, the social governance of, uh, of 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 companies by benefiting those that are. Uh, playing an important role in the in the community, so for for income land, it was really for us to contribute to this to answer to a growing need that we see all around us in the investor community, and to make sure that these um, receivables, these trade receivables, are also answering uh, their concerns around ESG standards. So that was for us to. Income land for income land to play a role in this entire uh, environment and ecosystem. Okay, yeah. And how do you how do you plan to do it? I mean, what can you give us a few more details about how it works within income land? Well, we uh, we put in line we put a line uh, for 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 one thing of sixty million dollars uh, for exporters, uh, predominantly in Asia, that would comply with various ESG standards. We're at the initial phase of the ESG standards where it's going to get more and more um, stringent, um, 
where the requirements are going to get more uh, stricter and stricter. Um, but it is for us to put these lines and to have our team to screen the companies that we find in, in Asia that are exporting and wanting their receivables to be fine. As like I said, on cross-border uh, post-shipment uh, uh, receivables financing, uh, anything that's on open account. And for these companies, whenever they, they meet these criteria, to give them an easy access to, to this financing. Now, this is a first line that we put in place. We intend to have others uh, subsequently that will be rolled, uh, rolled over during the, the next year. This is just a, a stepping stone into it. Yeah, it makes sense to start now, and I'm sure it will get easier and easier as well as ESG standards become mm -hmm. more harmonized mm -hmm. and, and clearer yeah. right, for everyone. Great. Um, so I'll give you the last question, uh, which is more of a personal question. Uh, I'd like to end with a little bit of inspiration. So as a, as a seasoned entrepreneur and an investor yourself, um, could you share the, les the latest thing that you've read or heard that um, inspired you or sparked your interest? And it doesn't have to be related to trade finance. Well, I, I, I would say that one of the things that are... Um, that I'm very, uh, very sensitive to is anything that's related to the environment. Um, it's always been like this ever since I was a little kid. Uh, for me, the uh, nature has always played uh, an important role in my life. And I come from um, a family from a rural uh, part, of, uh, part of France. Um, the growing awareness and, and concerns that are building up around the environment is uh, for me with Income Land, a way for us to make an impact, um, be it very small, uh, but nonetheless to be able to talk about it and to uh, favor companies and support companies that are, um, that are making an impact around this. Um, so for me, uh, the entire um, awareness around the environment is something that I look with a very um, positive eye uh, and, and I'm very happy that we're able to make a, a contribution to this as income line. Yeah, it must be an exciting time for you then. And I agree, it's, it's time for all companies really to start making their own even small impact, right? Correct. So thank you. Thank you so much for answering that. And uh, thank you, Swajit, as well for all your insights. Um, we've run out of time. So I would like to thank you both for, for the time and for, for all the information that you shared with us. And I'll also take this time to thank our listeners and encourage you to leave any comments you have in the comments section. Thank you very much.